It was a beautiful winter day in Austin, Texas. The temperature was 20 degrees and a light westerly breeze was blowing. The evening looked even more spectacular. A full moon, a temperature of about 10 degrees at 8 p.m. It all matched the perfect forecast. To top it off, Florida Georgia Line was in concert at the Moody Center, and Henry Can had two front row tickets to the show for him and his wife, Melanie. The 33-year-old couple, married for nearly five years, were expected to celebrate Valentine's Day a week early. The only problem was that it wasn't very warm in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. In fact, it was about 12 degrees cold. There was 30 centimeters of snow on the ground, and it was predicted to snow another 20 centimeters before it melted. What does this have to do with Henry Melanie and a date with Tyler Hubbard, Brian Kelly, and the rest of the crew? Good question. Henry was called at the last minute to fly out to Sioux Falls the day before to fix a major computer glitch at the Sanford Biomedical Center. When the problem occurred, their neonatal unit was involved in a nationwide research project. Henry was the top IT person at his company and rarely traveled for business. But Sanford was their third largest client, so Henry took the first available flight out of AUS on Thursday. Yeah, it took him about six hours to get everything sorted out. He had a return flight to Austin booked for 6 a.m. that would get him home 10 hours before the concert. The only problem was that by 3 a.m., there was already 30 centimeters of snow on the ground and it was still snowing. The airline app on his cell phone popped up notifications of delays and then finally flight cancellations. Henry stayed awake and looked for options. Henry was well compensated for his work, and he was worth every penny, but his boss would not be happy if he booked a flight home. However, he had just saved his company several thousand dollars more than a charter would have cost, so he tried that option. By 5 a.m., it was clear that no one would be flying anytime soon. The snowfall continued all day, with temperatures dropping to about 15 degrees cold. Some were calling it the storm of the decade. All Henry could think was, damn. Around 9 a.m., he dialed Melanie's office's speed dial. Her assistant, Kim, answered after the second beep and put him through. Hey, babe, I'm so excited about tonight. What time are you going to be home? Mel, have you seen what the weather is like in Sioux Falls? No, Henry, I knew that's where you were headed, but I wasn't paying attention. What's going on? Unfortunately, there's a hell of a lot of snow. 30 centimeters so far, and it's probably going to be another 20 today before it goes down. All flights are canceled. Oh, baby, I'm so sorry. I was so excited about tonight. I know I've been working a lot lately, and this was the perfect chance to start a romantic weekend together. Damn, sometimes I hate your job. I'm frustrated too, Mel, but you know I only travel four or five times a year, and only when absolutely necessary. It was a major crisis with a major client. Like you said, we've rarely been together in the last few months, but you're the one spending crazy hours, not me. If anything, my job allows us to have a damn good Texas lifestyle. You're right, Henry. It's just that lately we've been apart more often than we've been together. I know a lot of that is down to me. I'm working hard to make partner, which means I have to make the time. You've gotten to the point where you can determine most of your schedule yourself and keep it within reason. I'm getting there, but it will be another year or so before I start controlling my work hours. I miss you and I miss us. Me too, baby. Why don't you grab your friend Sue and go have some fun? Tickets are front row, and trying to sell them is too much trouble. I can order a car to pick you up and take you home. Don't let my mess spoil the enjoyment of a great show. Melanie hesitated and offered to just sell the tickets. She would just stay home and watch the online streaming of the concert. She could log into their Ticketmaster account and sell tickets with no problem. She went on and on about how she wouldn't want to go if he wasn't with her. Henry resisted, urging her to go and have fun. He reminded her that she had a new pair of Tacova boots, and the stylish boots looked sexy on her. After a few minutes of arguing, she relented. They both said, I love you, and hung up. Five minutes later, Melanie found her disposable cell phone in the back compartment of her large bag and hit the speed dial button. This was her part of the conversation. Hi, how's your day going? Well, maybe I have something to cheer you up. Henry just called, and he's stuck in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Yeah, he had to rush down there on business, and there was a big snowstorm. Can you believe his bad luck? Yeah, good luck to you. Anyway, I still have two tickets for tonight. 
but hubby will be chilling in the great white north. Is Diana still visiting her parents in Memphis? Oh, that's great. How about we spend the evening together? I have a new denim skirt and boots I've been wanting to try on for a while. I'll call a cab to your house and we'll hit the road. How's that sound? Yes, I'll order a dark cab to make sure we have tinted windows. Giggle. Yeah, let's have an all-night party after the concert. I'll see you around seven. I can't wait. Melanie worked hard and made it through lunch so she could leave the firm by 4.30 p.m. She wanted to soak in the tub and rest for an hour before heading to the concert. Before leaving the office, she called her best friend, Susan O'Connor. They had met in her first year at the firm and had hit it off immediately. There was only a one-year age difference, and they had gotten married only two weeks apart that year, so they had a lot in common. Hey, Susie. Baby, do me a favor. What's up, Mel? I'm happy to help if I can. If Henry ever asks you how we did at the Florida Georgia Line concert tonight, your answer would be terrific. What the fuck, Mel? Are you still sleeping with David the asshole? Mel giggled. Yes, I just can't get enough of him. I know his fellow partners call him that because he can be a jerk. But let me tell you, there's another good reason for the nickname asshole. Sue was not amused by this. Mel, Henry is an amazing person, and you guys together make an awesome couple. It's that moment when you start thinking about kids and starting a family together. You're not in college anymore, sister. Why are you spreading your legs for this asshole? Mel sighed. Her friend was loyal, but she was also a little more conservative in her views on fidelity. I know, I know, Sue. Henry is a great guy, and I'm not going to lose him. David is unbridled and fun. We are both happy in our marriages, but really there is just a sexual spark between us that rocks our worlds. Mel, you really need to think carefully before you open your mouth. If you were happily married, you wouldn't be tangling with your boss in lovemaking, and he wouldn't have any of his female employees if he was happy. What part of your marriage vows did you not understand? Renouncing all the others is pretty trivial. Mel was getting tired of being lectured by her friend. Sue, will you have my back or not, if Henry ever asks? I won't give any information and I'll never bring it up, but if he asks me, I'll tell him I was with you. Where are we sitting? Front row, right in the middle. Thank you, Susie. You're the best. Next weekend, we're spending the day at the spa. My treat. So Henry bought the perfect tickets. Now you're using his gift to cheat on him with David, Sue thought, and out of her mouth came, okay, bye. Mel rushed home and started getting ready for her date. She had a couple of glasses of her favorite Pinot Grigio, shaved her legs in the bubble bath, and then got dressed. She was wearing a white lace bra so she could undo a couple of the top buttons on her white blouse. Her skirt rose about 15 centimeters above her knees, showing off her shapely legs. The boots were a dark gray color and matched her vest. They had been a Christmas present from Henry. It was the first time she'd worn them, but was so excited she hadn't caught the irony of the occasion. She looked in the mirror and was pleased with what she saw when she looked back. She thought she would turn a few heads this evening, but she was only interested in one. Ordering a cab, she had another glass of wine. When it arrived, she mentioned one stop on the way to the concert. The driver was happy to oblige. More money in his pocket suited him just fine. The car pulled up to a gated cottage community. Melanie gave him the code to enter. They drove two blocks and stopped at the curb. As if on cue, David Miller, Melanie's boss, jumped out of his house and jumped into the back seat, greeting his companion with an enthusiastic and passionate kiss. My goodness, Mel, you smell and look wonderful. I think we should skip the concert and go straight to your house. Melanie responded to his kiss by opening her mouth and taking him in with a purr. Calm down, big boy. We'll have plenty of time for that later. It's going to be a great show. The cab driver remained silent, but noticed the wedding ring and diamond on her left hand as she kissed and caressed her lover. Whore and bastard, he muttered to himself. For her part, Mel had never intended to cheat on her husband. They had met on a blind date organized by her best friend. A mutual attraction had quickly developed between them. She was outgoing, friendly, and easy to get along with. Henry was a little more reserved, but there was an inner strength that attracted her. He never overshadowed her, but she always felt safe in his presence. He was kind, but firm, heartfelt, and wise beyond his years. 
He had attended college on a scholarship and after graduation had served in the Marine Corps for five years. That experience combined with his personality made him a guy that others could always count on. That character trait seemed as sexy to Mel as his 190-centimeter height with rugged good looks. Henry was skeptical of Mel's hobbies from the beginning. He never considered himself a lucky lot or anything special. The Corps had taught him that it was his duty to take care of those around him. You command the front lines and you're the last to retreat, he'd been drilled at headquarters. This rule made an impression on him that stayed with him even after his return to civilian life so the fact that he was being pursued by a beautiful woman made him slightly embarrassed. The only time he felt out of place was when Mel suddenly grabbed him and kissed him passionately or looked at him across the crowded room with a look that could only be defined as, I need you to figure out how to fuck me right now. As they grew together, Henry's fears subsided, and Mel's confidence in them grew. They married after an 18-month courtship that included a four-month engagement. Henry's communications expertise and natural ability landed him a great job at his current firm in Austin. In his third year with the company, he became head of his own department. In his fifth year, he became vice president of IT development and client support. Mel graduated from law school nine months after they married and landed a solid entry-level position at a mid-sized Austin firm specializing in oil and mineral rights. She was very savvy and caught the eye of three of the firm's partners, Connor, Sims, and Miller. And that's when the trouble started. David Miller was a 43-year-old married man with two teenage children. His wife, Diane, was the principal of a local high school. Mel liked her and had always thought they were well-suited to each other as a married couple. Many things about her boss were a mystery to her. What was clear, however, was that David Miller was a tough nut to work for. He worked at least 55 hours a week as senior partner, while his two colleagues worked barely 40. He expected his team to work somewhere in the range of 70 hours a week. Mel was in her third year at the firm and had finally made the transition to a 65-hour work week. Miller seemed pleased with her work and gave her better assignments. They began to spend more time together, more time spent together during the day and after hours spending more time with the team and just the two of them. Soon, the alone time became much more important than socializing with the team. They began to socialize more intimately and even touched each other sometimes. They were playing with fire. Both of them realized that. It took six months before a real flame erupted from the spark. They won a major court case that netted a profit of about $2 million. David's share was to be about $400,000, and Mel was to receive a $45,000 bonus. A team of six people gathered in David's office to celebrate closer to evening. The jerk was in such a good mood that he even opened a bottle of his collectible bourbon for the occasion. An hour later, the party was coming to an end. David asked Mel to step aside for a moment. This elicited a couple of smirks from the more observant visitors. David escorted the last visitor out and quietly locked the door. He turned around when Mel, leaning against his desk, was already unbuttoning her blouse. David strode across the room like a man possessed. He enveloped her in a hug and sank into her with a passionate kiss. David wasn't as big or as strong as Henry, but he was more determined. He was the kind of guy who knew what he wanted and went after it. He had wanted Mel since he first started working closely with her about two years ago. His lust had been building up for a long time, and now it was giving vent. You're amazing, Mel, David finally said, pulling away from her, letting her turn around and enclosing her in his arms. I love this hot and salacious talk, but I think you're incredible, and I hope there's more to it. No, David, I don't think this is just a one-time thing. I feel a connection with you that I don't want to resist. We're both married and we want to keep it that way, but I hope you and I have moments like tonight very often. I'm glad to hear you say all that, Mel. Yes, we both want to save our marriage, but I also want there to be more moments like this one. That was six months ago, and now Mel and David were out on the concert stage hand in hand. They hid their infidelity well, but still made sure to see each other at least twice a month. Tonight, if they were worried about being seen, they didn't show it. They weren't overly attached to each other, but even an outside observer could tell that this was a rendezvous between two people who were drawn to each other. 
Back in Sioux Falls, a frustrated Henry decided to watch the concert live. If I can't be with her, maybe I can see her when they show the crowd, he thought to himself. After warming up, the band FGL burst onto the stage with a bang, playing four fast and loud songs. The cameraman didn't work too hard looking at the audience until the fifth song, which finally went slow. As the camera began to capture the couples in the audience, the love song Cruise came on. Henry almost ran to the bathroom when the song started playing, but remembered it was Mel's favorite song and stayed. Thirty seconds later, his world crumbled and his marriage fell apart. The camera stopped on a couple in the front row, just where Henry was buying tickets. The man and woman were hugging, slow dancing, and kissing passionately, clearly unaware that they were on the big screen. He unmistakably recognized Mel in her new boots that Henry had given her last Christmas. And although he didn't know him very well, there was no doubt that it was David Miller hugging and passionately kissing his wife. Henry sank to the floor, completely speechless. The pain of betrayal hit him like a blow under the breath. He was stunned. He was dizzy and struggling to breathe. The camera shifted to the other three couples, but then back to Mel and David. This time, Mel broke the kiss, looked up, and saw them on the screen. The look of panic on her face was impossible to hide. She buried her face into David's chest, pulling his head to her so he wouldn't look up. For 15 minutes, Henry sat on the floor, tears streaming from his eyes. He mumbled something like, why Mel? Or simply exclaimed angrily, fuck you, Mel. And of course, I'm going to fuck you, David Miller. As his composure began to return to him, he realized he had to move, and move fast. The Corps had taught him that if you sit still and do nothing, you die. If you move and take the fight to the enemy, you have a chance. He began to move. Henry called his good friend and attorney, Michael Lipscomb. Michael was a little surprised to get the call at 9.30 p.m. on a Friday night, but even more surprised to hear the subject. He apologized to Henry and re-interviewed him a couple of times, clarifying if Henry was sure it was Mel. After making sure it was, he told Henry to hang up, but to answer the phone, which was due to ring within the next five minutes. Three minutes later, the phone rang. He didn't recognize the number, but it was Austin's area code, 512. Hello, this is Henry Can. Hello, Mr. Can. This is Erica Hamilton, Michael's attorney and good friend. Hello, Mrs. Hamilton. Thank you for calling me. Call me Erica and I'll call you Henry, Erica replied. Henry was about to say something, but she continued. I'm sorry to be so harsh with you, Henry, but time is of the essence. Your wife is at a concert with another man, and you witnessed their intimacy live on the air, correct? I did. Okay, cell phone rings. Where were they sitting and what were they wearing, as far as you can tell? Henry answered as quickly and succinctly as possible. When we hang up, send me the latest and greatest picture of your wife that you have. As we speak, I have a private detective on his way to the concert. He'll be there in ten minutes and we'll spend the entire evening and the rest of the weekend with them, if need be. We need to gather as much evidence as possible and as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you. Henry, can you think of an excuse to stay in Sioux Falls for a couple more days? I'd like our evidence to be irrefutable, and just one night at a concert doesn't prove it. If you can stay late because of the snow or do a little more work for your client, we have a better chance of catching him with his pants down. Please forgive me for being blunt. Yes, I can arrange that, Henry replied. Okay, Henry, send me the picture as soon as possible and wait for my call. I will call you back no later than tomorrow noon with an update. Call your wife in the morning at your convenience and let her know that you will be delayed until at least Monday evening. I assume your employer won't mind. Yes, I'm a senior vice president, so I have a flexible schedule. I could still work with a client on Monday. Oh, that's great. I'm sorry, but I have to run. We'll talk tomorrow. Henry was grateful for the conversation and quick action. He was still dizzy and had no idea what the end result would be. But it was clear this woman was good. He barely slept that night and, for the record, never listened to FGL again. By 5.30 in the morning, Henry had given up trying to sleep. He got up and looked outside. The snowfall had gotten weaker, but it was still coming. He turned on the local radio station. A total of 55 centimeters of snow had fallen in the last 36 hours. That's a real record for Sioux Falls. 
Obviously, nothing much would happen for the rest of the day or even the next day. Henry began to take notes. Cheating was a regular occurrence for her. Whether it was the first time or the hundredth time didn't matter. He wouldn't tolerate a breach of trust between close relatives. As if cheating wasn't horrible enough, the contempt they both showed for him was beyond anything. They slow danced and kissed in a very crowded place in his town. Even if only one or two acquaintances saw them, rumors would spread. Did you hear that Melanie Can is tooting her husband's horn with her boss? There was no way he'd put up with that shit. He analyzed his actions as her husband over the past five years. He'd always been faithful to her, but it wasn't like women were busting down his door. He rarely looked at another woman. He was head over heels in love with Mel, and that meant he was absolutely faithful to her. They fought from time to time, but he was a good husband to her. Caring, friendly, protective, but always respecting her as an equal partner. No, he didn't deserve such neglect. He made a detailed list of assets and liabilities. He made a very short list of people he needed to call, including his boss, his father, and two buddies from the Corps. He made a list of next steps in anticipation of talking to Erica. It was only 7 a.m., so he pulled on his sweatpants, headed to the hotel fitness room, and worked out hard until 9. After showering and eating breakfast, he picked up his phone. There were two messages from Mel asking how he was doing and telling him how much she missed him. She mentioned that the concert had gone well and Sue had joined her. Another show of disrespect. He decided to check something out. Perhaps he should have waited for his lawyer to check it out, but he was a Marine after all. Inaction in a crisis didn't seem like a good option to him. The phone rang twice before it was answered. Hi, Henry, Sue said. I heard you were stuck in Sioux Falls. I saw the weather map. It looks terrible. Hi, Sue. Yeah, it's white outside. It hasn't snowed this much in Texas in ages, much less in one day. I'll be glad to get home. What can I do for you, Henry? Sue sounded nervous. Look, Sue, I'm just curious. How did you like the concert last night? I loved the opening song, This Is How We Roll. I watched it live from my hotel room. Yeah, Henry, it was a great show. I know Mel had fun, but I really missed you. Thanks for saying that, Sue. Can I ask you one more quick question before I let you go? Uh, sure. I know you're a huge FGL fan, so I'm wondering how the hell you could have confused This Is How We Roll with Up Down, the song they opened last night with. How is that possible, Sue? There was silence on the other end of the line, and Henry continued. Sue, I know you're a friend of Mel's, but I also considered you a friend as well as Jim, her husband. But now you seem to have taken sides and are willing to give up our friendship so she can sleep with her boss. I'm not sure what I've done to you and Jim to deserve such disrespect, but your betrayal hurts me deeply. A huge lump came to Sue's throat and tears came to her eyes. It came to her that she had done the wrong thing by covering for Mel. No friend would ever ask someone they cared about to help them be dishonest and hurt others. I'm so sorry, Henry, she replied almost in a whisper. How long has this been going on, Sue? How long has David Miller had my wife? About six months, Henry. Henry had been prepared for something like that, but was confused when he heard it for the first time. He had to work hard to keep his composure. Sue, does Jim know that you're lying for Mel and helping her break her wedding vows to cheat on me? Sue gasped. Oh no, Henry, Jim doesn't know anything about that. He would be mortified and utterly ashamed to learn of my role. Okay, Sue, for now I won't tell Jim about the part you played. It'll all come out soon, and I'm sure he'll have questions for you to answer. Jim is a good man, so my advice to you is to come clean when the time comes. In the meantime, if I find out that you've said a word about this conversation with Mel, I'll call Jim myself and make damn sure he understands unequivocally what part you played in helping Mel accuse me of disrespecting and destroying our marriage. Now Sue was crying. No, Henry, I won't say anything to Mel. I won't even answer texts or phone calls over the weekend. I will find a way to avoid talking to her. I'm really, really sorry, and I'm ashamed, Henry. Henry disconnected without saying goodbye. On the other end of the line, Sue began to realize the depth of her stupidity in the name of friendship. She knew she would have to talk to Jim as soon as possible.
probably best would be right now. Then Henry called Mel on the phone. Her voice was sleepy, but she played the role of loving wife perfectly. She pouted a little when she learned that he wouldn't be home until Monday evening at the earliest. She and Sue had fun, but it was different without him. She didn't have much planned for the day. Run some errands, clean the house, nothing major. She promised she'd cook something special when her hubby got home. She ended the conversation with a polite, I love you. Henry replied, goodbye. She thought it was weird, but then David started fondling her breasts in a way that drove her crazy, so she didn't think about it anymore. At 11.58 a.m., Henry's cell phone rang. It was Erica. She gave him the latest news very briefly and then said she would call back around 7 p.m. with a detailed report. She called at exactly 7 p.m. It basically boiled down to the following. The shooting was very, very good. The private investigator came to the concert and took some more pictures. Mel was scared of the cameras for a while, but by the end of the concert, they were hugging and kissing again. They went back to Henry and Mel's house. The private investigator saw this coming and put recording equipment in several rooms. They spent the night having violent sex in the master bedroom. Later, in the kitchen, they had a casual but frank conversation about what their relationship had been like from the beginning. They frankly mentioned several sexual escapades within the walls of the law office. They also discussed how to keep it a secret. Okay. They went out to lunch and then returned to the can bedroom for an afternoon and evening of sex again. The private investigator would continue to observe and record, but Erica assumed it would be about the same. She then wanted to know what was on Henry's mind. He had been thinking and taking notes all day. He shared his thoughts with his lawyer. She has despised me publicly and privately for six months. Our marriage is dissolved, he began. She must feel the humiliation she has brought upon me in the eyes of her friends and family. The truth of her actions must come out. There's no reason to exaggerate. The facts speak for themselves, but no nonsense about irreconcilable differences. I want her served at work as soon as possible. I want his wife to know when I'm serving Mel, and maybe she can coordinate and serve her husband at the same time. The same goes for David. I want his wife to have everything we have on him. I hope and pray that in the divorce, she will take over for him. I also hope that his partners have more morals than he does and will force him to leave the practice. Perhaps if we threaten to sue the firm over their repeatedly having sex in the office, we could motivate them in that direction. I don't want to stay in this house. I need to sell it. There are too many memories. Honestly, I don't even know if I'll stay in Texas. However, I don't want her living there either. I hope we can split the stock 50-50 when we sell. I also want to protect all my assets. I don't mind spending my money on car payments or other small debts, but I'm pretty sure I don't want her getting child support from me. She had just received a large award and the amount was already in the six figures. Erica asked some clarifying questions. She told Henry that given his ability to make good money, she would probably get some alimony. However, if the law firm had a morals clause, they could clearly prove that her infidelity had ruined the marriage. That might have helped. Henry will stay in Sioux Falls or return to Austin, hiding out until Tuesday afternoon. Mel will be served mid-afternoon. Erica will try to track down Mrs. Miller before then and see if she wants to join in the fun. Henry noticed that Mel didn't call him again on Saturday or early Sunday evening. She and that jerk must have been having a wonderful time. He knew he had to call her, or she might get suspicious. He called around nine o'clock. Hey, you. I was just thinking about you and realized that we haven't talked since yesterday. I hope you're still going home tomorrow. I can't wait to see you. I missed you so much. I'm sorry, Mel, but that'll be Tuesday. I have business at O'Hare Airport, so I'll be home around three in the afternoon so we can plan a dinner together. Okay, she replied disappointedly. But the next time I meet with James, CEO and Henry's boss, I'll tell him no more winter trips. He ruined a perfectly wonderful weekend we were supposed to enjoy together. You'll tell him when you want to, when you see him again, Henry said, almost laughing at the thought. He thought to himself, what a damn heartless evil bitch you've become, Mel. They talked for another minute or two, and before hanging up, Mel said, Henry, I love you so much. You know that, don't you? You know how much I love you. Yes, Mel, Henry replied, holding back tears. I know exactly how much you love me. 
and with those words he hung up the phone. He just couldn't afford to humiliate her, even if he let her know what was happening to her, and he knew what was happening to her. She'll never humiliate me again, he thought as he dialed his boss James's number to keep him informed. On Tuesday, at three o'clock sharp in the afternoon, Henry sat at the kitchen table. He wasn't sure when Mel would be home. He had learned from Erica that everything was going according to plan. She was to be served somewhere between two and four. Apparently, Mrs. Miller had already forgiven the jerk for his two previous affairs with women like Mel. She was in no mood to forgive a third and happily hired Erica to represent her. Both Henry Can and Diane Miller were named as plaintiffs in a civil suit against Connor, Sims, and Miller. Erica reminded both that she didn't think it was going anywhere, but rumor had it that while Connor and Sims weren't necessarily church choir boys, they weren't the type to put up with a lack of morals that hurt their business. At 3.15 p.m., Erica called Henry to let him know that the deed was done. While they briefly discussed next steps, Henry's phone was bursting with messages and calls from Mel. In order, the messages read, What the hell? How dare you humiliate me in my workplace? Answer me, asshole. You better be home when I get here. I'll never forgive you for that. Henry had only been in combat twice. His job in communications was to provide combat support. But every Marine is trained to be a gunner, and twice in Iraq, he was caught in a firefight. Neither lasted long, and his captain, who never praised anyone, took the young lieutenant aside and told him that for a rookie, he was holding up well. Henry's combat experience helped him stay calm and determined in the face of the fight that was about to break out in his kitchen. Henry, Henry, where the hell have you been? shouted Mel, appearing from the side door off the driveway. Henry sat silently at the table. Mel came out from around the corner with a folder in hand and threw it furiously on the desk. You bastard! You served me divorce papers at work? How could you do that? How could you be so cruel? Do you realize how humiliating that was? Then her tone softened a little. Why, Henry? Why would you want a divorce? We love each other. We have a great marriage and a wonderful future. What are you thinking? Talk to me. Henry remained calm. He realized that this was the first time he had seen Mel since he had been made aware of the horrible discovery last Friday night. Her eyes seemed sunken and puffy. She was nervous. He noticed that she had opened the divorce petition but didn't seem to be looking through the paperwork. Sit down, Mel, and we'll discuss this. Don't ask me to sit down, you bastard. Who the fuck do you think you are? Are you sleeping with some girl on the side? I swear I'll cut your balls off if you are. She hovered over him. That's enough, Henry thought to himself. He stood up and hovered over her, looking down from above with a calm but grim expression on his face. He said again in a voice that demanded attention. Sit down, Mel. Now. She sat down. Mel, have you even looked at the file attached to the divorce petition? She shook her head from side to side, but didn't reach for the file. Well, let's look at what caused my world to come crashing down around me last Friday night. First of all, here's a picture of you with David the asshole at the concert. No, that's not Sue. Since you lied to me, that's your boss. It's a loving embrace and a passionate kiss that you both enjoy. So Mel moved away from the table as if the painting was a rattlesnake ready to lunge. David, that's not... TCC. Shh, Mel, it's my time to talk. You'll get your chance. The next item is a flash drive. I'm not going to put it in and play it. You can do that on your laptop later. But it's a recording of you and this asshole having sex in our bed last Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. It also includes conversations that took place right here at this table, in our home, between you and this jerk discussing past sexual adventures and how to keep Mrs. Diane Miller and me in the dark about the future. By the way, I know your office isn't exactly next door to this asshole's office, so you may not have noticed that Mrs. Miller filed divorce papers for him today, too. I don't know how he's going to explain to his teenage kids that he got caught having sex with a female co-worker for the third time. But that's not my problem. You knew you were number three, right? Melanie flinched at this revelation. Apparently, she thought she was special, the only one he'd ever been with out of wedlock. Apparently, the jerk was also a great liar. But then again, he was a lawyer. 
What did she expect? Okay, anyway, there are more pages in there describing your cheating as far back as Sue could remember. Apparently, she realized that covering your ass could cost her marriage to Jim. So she turned to the prosecution's evidence from a legal standpoint. Put another way, you could say she outed you and told you everything. All the nights she lied and said you were with her. Even the weekend with the girls last November was a ruse to get you and that asshole to sneak into South Padre. By the way, I wouldn't call Sue anytime soon. Jim has made it clear that the marriage is over if she talks to you without him. Finally, do you have a copy of the civil suit that Diane Miller and I are filing against your law firm? Having sex with an asshole in our marital bed does not violate any company policy. However, his desk, couch, and private bathroom are all in the lawyer's office, so that's where we can take our case. Our attorney thinks we have a good chance of success in this case. So, my dear whore wife, this is why I'm divorcing you. You've broken my heart in ways I don't think I'll ever be able to put into words. I was so upset last week when I had to fly to Sioux Falls because I was excited to be able to spend time with the only woman I've ever loved. The only woman I ever wanted to love. My wife the person I hoped would be the mother of our children. Then, when I sat and watched the concert live, hoping for just a glimpse of my girl singing and dancing with her faithful friend Sue, I almost died when I saw her in the arms of another man, lusting after him, accepting his kisses and caresses. My soul was destroyed in an instant. I think I'm a man old enough to accept that what was done to me was unfair, Mel, even disgusting. People aren't perfect. I'm not perfect either. Forgiveness should always be part of a marriage. But you didn't hurt me. You despised me. You deliberately humiliated me in front of everyone. That I cannot forgive and I will not tolerate. I will not be married to you, Mel, for one second longer than it takes to get a divorce. I'm not going to make it easy for you. I'm going to keep as much of my money as I can. Your family and friends will know what you've done. I'm not going to hide the truth from those who spit in my face with their actions. You're on your own now. I think that's what you probably wanted all along. Okay, I'm done. Speak softly if you want to. Mel tried not to cry, but she wasn't very good at it. She was a strong and proud woman, but this man she claimed she loved, whom she had betrayed so deeply, had just ruined her by simply telling the truth. He had noticed the depth of her terrible actions and their consequences. She wanted to hate him, to blame him for everything. She tried desperately to avoid the obvious wrong, but... There was no escaping the truth of who she was. Did you tell my parents? No, I'll leave that up to you. I talked to my boss and a couple buddies I worked with. Other than my lawyer and our company attorney, Michael, I haven't talked to anyone. But let me be clear. If you try to hide the truth or whitewash your actions, I will turn everything over to them, including what's on the flash drive. I can't tell my parents everything. It would kill them if they heard all this. You can't hate me that much, Henry. Mel, you didn't care about my feelings or the fact that your choices broke my heart. You've been disgusting to me for at least six months, and that's assuming you've had no other lovers before that. Don't pretend to be a victim. I'll give you a week to tell them, and then I'll call. They better know exactly what happened, or they'll get a copy of everything. Henry, I swear, there were no others. David was the first and only one. Of course, Mel. And you and Sue were together at the concert last Friday. You and that jerk stayed up in our marital bed all weekend while you told me how much you loved me. I guess every time you open your mouth, you lie. I doubt you even know how to tell the truth in this situation. Henry, I didn't mean for this to happen. I wasn't looking for it. I was caught up in the moment when we won the Dutton case. As soon as we started, I wanted to stop it. But I just didn't. I don't know why. Really, Mel? You don't know why? Henry rummaged through the folder until he found the right page. I'm sorry. I should have realized from your conversations how much you wanted to be faithful to me. Like this quote from two days ago when you were both lying in our marital bed after sex. David, I just can't get enough of you. We have to be very careful. If Diane or Henry ever finds out, we'll have to break up, and I don't want to stop making love to you. Yes, Mel. You seem to be so inconsistent in your behavior. Not sleeping, but lying in the arms of another man in our bed, calling your actions lovemaking and admitting that you never want to stop. You're completely insane, Mel. Henry's words began to reach her. 
Mel leaned back in her chair for a minute or two without saying anything. Finally, she spoke. I have no excuse, Henry. I'm a grown woman and I made my choice. I thought I could hide it from you. I thought I could play this game and if you didn't find out, it would be harmless. I knew David was an asshole. I knew we would never love each other, even though we said those words. I never felt for him the way I feel for you. But I heartlessly betrayed you and your love for me. Mel was silent for a moment to blow her nose and dab her eyes. She looked across the table at Henry and immediately noticed two things. His wedding ring was on the table, and she knew from the look in his eyes that he was lost to her forever. He treated her with the same contempt she had treated him with. Her safe little world of a loving husband had crumbled. Henry, I don't know what to do or where to go. I can't leave home before the divorce. That would mean admitting it's over and committing financial suicide. I'm guessing you won't leave either. Can we agree to stay here for a while? I need time to think and decide on the next steps. I can't promise I won't push for a divorce. Right now, all I want is to be with you always. I can't imagine life without you. I will live in one of the spare rooms and avoid contact beyond what is necessary. Only as between roommates. I will respect your personal space. Mel, I can't tell you what to do, what to think or where to go. Erica, my attorney, told me not to leave the house until the divorce is official, and she said you'll feel the same way. You're staying in the master bedroom tonight. I refuse to sleep on the mattress you had fun on with that jerk. Tomorrow, I'll give it to the Salvation Army, and they'll bring us a new one. This will be my bed that you will never sleep on. Thank you for understanding, Henry. I would fight to stay if I had to. It's my only legal choice, but I appreciate you going along with it. I'll start moving my stuff tomorrow while you're at work. Mel stood up and walked over to give Henry a hug. He quickly pulled away from her. Fuck you, Mel. Don't you ever try to touch me again. That's all I can do, to be in the same room with you and stay calm. You've broken my heart and you've ruined us. I can't comfort you now or ever again for doing such a disgusting thing. You made your choices alone, and you are living them alone. I can never completely forget the way you flirted with me, Mel, but I will work as hard as I can to cut you out of my life as far as possible. And that journey has already begun. Mel collapsed back into her chair, dropped her head on the table, and sobbed. Epilogue. Mel fought the divorce as hard as she could. Deep down, she hoped Henry would soften and stay. She had to fight it, too, if she wanted to keep any shred of self-respect. Many of her friends had cut ties with her when they heard what she had done to Henry. Mel asked the court to schedule counseling, showing that she had already been in therapy and proving that she had nothing to do with David Miller. However, representing herself was never a good idea, but Mel was worried about attorney's fees, so she decided to give it a try. She put the process on hold for a while, but she never let it go to waste. Even Mel's parents begged her to let Henry go. They were horrified by her actions and sided with Henry, even though they tried to maintain a not-so-good relationship with their daughter. It took seven months to get the divorce. The house and savings were divided equally, but Henry didn't have to pay alimony. Miracles happen. Melanie left Connor, Sims, and Miller and went to work for a small firm in San Antonio. On the day of her divorce, she was leaving the house and turned around to say goodbye to Henry. He closed the door in her face before she could speak. She rarely goes on dates now, but usually comes home on Fridays with a random guy just to have fun. Perhaps human companionship soothes her soul. Perhaps it reminds her of being a whore who abandoned a good man in a marriage. Turns out Connor and Sims have souls after all, even if they are lawyers. They kicked Miller out, and a few months later he moved to Houston, where he took a position at a small law firm run by his cousin. Diane had ripped him off in the divorce and his children don't speak to him. The lawsuit that Henry and Diane filed was settled out of court for $250,000 for each of the plaintiffs. Erica was very happy with the results. David Miller began spending his evenings at the Oilers' rundown bar in the wrong part of town. One evening as he was leaving, a man approached him in the parking lot. He looked into Henry Can's eyes. There were no CCTV cameras in the area. Henry said, hey, asshole and then gave him a crushing blow with his fist to the face. His nose and jaw were broken. Henry leaned over him, and the man spit blood and a couple teeth out of his mouth. I wanted you to know who did this to you, David. I wanted you to look me in the eye and realize that this was going to happen. Now, 
if you'll just report it. There are 12 retired Marines sitting in a bar in downtown Austin right now, and most of them are wearing combat vests with decorations. They'll swear I was with them all night. If by some chance I get arrested and charged with assaulting you, one or two of them will come back and finish what I started. Do you understand, you piece of shit? Charges were never filed. About a year after the divorce, Henry was leaving a coffee shop in downtown Austin when he looked up and saw a beautiful woman about his own age walking inside. He held the door for her as she entered. Thank you, kind sir, she said. It's nice to see that some cowboys still have good manners. You're welcome, ma'am, Henry replied and headed for his car. He was about to drive off when he thought to himself, what the hell, and turned around heading back to the cafe. She was sitting facing the door and immediately looked up when he returned. He walked right up to her table, held out his hand and said, excuse me, but I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Henry. She shook his hand in greeting. It's nice to meet you, Henry. I'm Lori. Why don't you pull up a chair?